So, yeah, I'm reading from Psalm 1, the NIV version. So, blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked, or stand in the way that sinners take, or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord, and who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. Not so the wicked. They are like chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watch over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to destruction. Well, we're beginning another new series, that knowing, although it is knowing Jesus still, but that knowing you Jesus series was a short one to start the new year with. But um, we continue to get to know him, don't we? Right, well... Super Psalms is the latest series, and there are many, many Super Psalms, don't you think? Some uh, that are incredible, to be fair. You could say they all are, but we all have our favourites, don't we? I'm, I'm, I'm entitling this sermon, which is on Psalm 1, The Influencer. The Influencer. When we watch and listen and think on stuff, It has an influence on us. Nothing washes over you. We may think it does, but it doesn't. It could be music. It could be TV. It could be films that we watch. It could be computer games. It could be social media, which has a massive influence and shapes people no end, sadly. Um, It could be your family. It could be church. It could be politics. It could be opinions. It could be friends. It could be world views. Everything, and we're bombarded by everything, has power to shape who you are, what you think, how you talk, and how you live. We could sometimes underestimate it and be desensitised. For instance, fashion. Who or what dictates the latest fashion? Well, I haven't got a clue. I don't know about you. But still, cool people model something, and then everyone else is told it's cool, and they go out and buy it. Well, why? I don't know, but they do. The power of advertising, the power of who's modelling it, the power of whoever says something's cool. The news. It's reported in a certain way. We watch and we hear different news channels, or if you do that, you notice that some channels leave something out, they probably all do, Even some ignore certain news items that could be quite important because they don't want you to think a certain way. And others put things in because it backs up what they want you to think, including the BBC. Thank you. I stopped watching them a long time ago. Anyway, that's up to you. It's their claims for impartial that get to me because they're clearly not. Um, Years ago... Someone in the media said this, we decide what people are going to think tomorrow. That is terrifying. I read an article, I went on a website seeing the effect of media and sure enough it was there. Shapes everybody's thinking. Who really knows in this day and age what the truth is? Well, thankfully the Lord knows. Jesus prays to the Father, John 17, 17. Sanctify them, that's us, Sanctify them, set them apart, influence them by the truth. Your word is truth. And this is actually what this passage is really about. It's all really about how to stay blessed or happy, it means, or content or satisfied in Jesus. By choosing the right influence. And Psalm 1 verse 1 begins like this. Blessed is the one who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, or stand in the way of sinners, or or sit in the seat of mockers. How to stay blessed, happy, content in Jesus? Firstly, by not 
There's some negatives, and then there's positives. Some people say to me, oh, don't be so negative. Did you know two-thirds of the Bible is negative? There's a negative, and there's a positive. That's life. Anyway, I'm not saying we dwell on the negative, but we shouldn't ignore it and think it's bad. By how to stay blessed and happy and content in Jesus? By not adopting the ideas of those who reject him. Verse 1, blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked. Now, blessed here means real, true happiness, a life that is desirable because that person is so blessed, and others see that that person who's made right by God, which is why he's blessed, are different from them, and they have something they don't have, and they see the difference, and they're drawn to it and attracted to it. What is the difference, though? Are you a good person? Not particularly. The difference is Jesus. And if we break this song down to what the individual bits mean, so verse 1, sorry, blessed, which is a true, real, desirable happiness, is the one who does not walk, in other words, adopt the way of life, in the counsel by taking advice and thoughts of the wicked. Those who don't know Jesus are the wicked, don't want to live for him. It doesn't mean you're absolutely terribly wicked and utterly uh, incapable of doing good. It's the Bible's... Uh, he calls those that are saved and know Jesus the righteous and others the wicked. Seems a bit extreme, doesn't it, in our day and age, but that's what it means. It doesn't mean you're absolutely incapable of doing good. If you embrace and adopt and take on board the anti-God views and the ideas and the philosophies of this world, you'll kick off a process in your mind that ultimately leads to destruction, as our verse 6 said. The things we watch and the, the lyrics we listen to and the stuff we read and sometimes the company we keep influence you either for good or for bad. Nowadays, because I came a cropper on a met, lots of them, my musical taste used to be quite dark, so now I have to filter it a bit. So if I like a song that isn't Christian, or even is Christian, I put the lyrics onto Google. You know, all you need to do is put one line and it shows you the lyrics. I think, right, I'm having that or I'm not having that. And it really helps. Google can be your friend. But whatever fills your head has the power to lead you to or away from Jesus. And it's a process. So he's describing this process. First, this person takes on board the counsel of the wicked, the thoughts of the world that are against what God thinks or Jesus thinks. Let me give you an example of the counsel of the wicked. Porn. Well, it's not doing anyone any harm. I just do it in, in, in my own little world. I go into, nobody needs to know. Uh, it's not harming anybody, really. When you watch porn, you're watching prostitution. You're watching people who have been trafficked against their will. You are watching people who are forced against their will with no way out. You're watching violence. You're watching rape. You're watching damaged and abused people. And some of those, many of those, hate what they do and they have to numb the pain by taking heavy drugs, prostitution, addiction at huge lengths. Not doing any harm. Watching people who are being degraded and destroyed. That is the Council of the Wicked today. Seems normal. It's not. The Council of the weaker. Wicked. Sex outside of marriage is fine. God understands we're getting married anyway. Mocking, bullying, manipulating, controlling others. What's wrong with lying, if you're, especially when you're backed into a corner? That's what we hear. Cheating on your partner. They found out, not what it looks like. It was a moment of weakness. I'm a man with needs. I couldn't help myself. What they know won't hurt them. They're probably doing it anyway. Taking stuff from work. After all, everyone else does it. Don't pay me much. Might as well get a perk. Might as well make up for it. They won't miss it anyway. The counsel of the wicked. Why should I apologise? I'm not forgiving her. Did you hear what he said and he did? It's always somebody else's fault. I'm not taking responsibility for that. It's her problem, not mine. I'll just get a life. I've got a life. It's eternal. <laughs> That's a good answer, isn't it? I'll teach him a lesson he'll never forget I'll blank him I'll avoid him 
stepping over others to get what you want, looking after just me and mine, doesn't matter about anybody else, cancelling, punishing those who think differently from you, the counsel of the wicked. How to stay happy and content and blessed in Jesus by not adopting the ideas of those who reject him is the first one. And the second one is by not desiring the company of those who reject him. Just, just let me say this. I'm not saying you shouldn't have non-Christian friends. How would they ever hear the gospel? Um, obviously, we have family where there are many who don't know Jesus. That's all different. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about desiring the company of those who reject him when you have a choice and when it's uh, other people. Verse 1, or st- who are against Christ. Verse 1, or stand in the way of sinners. This doesn't mean you're objecting to sinners and getting in their way. No, it means actually the opposite. There's a picture here where there's someone and he kind of wants to be part of a group or at least is curious. And so he finds out where they hang out, maybe on a street corner under a lamp, like in our area, or maybe outside the offy, the off-licence, uh, like that, that's what I used to do. And then you stand waiting for them as they pass by because you're wanting to be around them. So you're not quite a part of them yet, but you're kind of curious. It's a bit like the youth, and they see other youth um, hanging around the neighbourhood, and, and they seem cool. I like what they're wearing, and it, I'd like to see what they're into. And uh, they're vaping, and uh, that seems to be quite good at the moment, doesn't it? I'll hang around that shop where they meet. Perhaps you're wanting to be included or popular. So you get in with folks who ultimately are very happy to live without Christ and even dislike Christ. See, there's a process here. First you listen and adopt to the ideas of this world, the counsel of the wicked. Then you desire to be in their company. It started by taking on board the thoughts of those who don't want Christ in their lives and now it comes with a desire to hang out with them to maybe see what you're missing. That's what the Bible means by standing in the way of sinners, going their way, hanging out with them. I was doing great at school. Unbelievably, I had A's and B's, went to a grammar school until year nine and then I got to know some lads. Very similar process not interested in working hard, they couldn't be bothered about their results, couldn't be bothered about the future, rebelled against the teachers and the whole system, but they seemed to be having a cracking time and they were living for the moment and I loved it. So I started listening to them because what they seemed to be doing looked incredibly attractive. The next thing, I was hanging out with them, finally I was one of them and then I was probably at the top of one of them. How do we stay blessed and happy in Jesus? By not desiring the company of those who reject him. How do we stay happy, blessed in Jesus? By not becoming one of them. Verse 1. Or sit in the seat of mockers. So here it goes. You've been influenced by what the world thinks, which produces a desire to find out more by hanging out with them, and you end up being like and becoming one of them. Now, you could stop this process at any, any point, but that's the process. Now this person is sitting with them. Part of them belongs to them. And what's worse, he's turned full circle because now he's joining them in mocking everyone who doesn't think and say and do what he does and what they do. I remember a young woman, well, I'd first become a Christian, and uh, she come to the Lord shortly after me and she seemed so on fire and she was really into Jesus but she slowly but surely got pulled back in and this process described her perfectly because she started to listen to her old friends again then she started hanging in with them again and not long after she was spotted in a nightclub sitting with others actively mocking Christians it's easy to think it'll never happen to you it's easy to think it'll never happen to me but it starts somewhere It starts with an influence which creates a desire which then, if not careful, creates a belonging. Be very careful because the devil is very, very clever and he works in sync with our old sinful nature. And if you take your eye off, you'd be surprised. 
The devil is very, very subtle. It's a drip drip. It's a slow process. And then later you find yourself in a mess like the prodigal son and you may, but the trouble is so often you may not see it as a mess and may want to stay put. The prodigal son came to his senses, but you can, there's such a spiritual madness where you don't come to your senses. And then you think, nah, I, I, all that was rubbish. And now I'm enjoying myself. I'm never going back. Oh, that's not going to be me. Well, you don't know that. But you can avoid it. You can stop it happening. I bet we all know people who are doing so well with the Lord. And now they're miles away from Jesus. It says in the end times, many will abandon the faith and go after things taught by demons. You and I sometimes need to be warned. 1 Peter 5 verse 8. Be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. The thing is, most of the time, the devil hides his lionness. And he comes instead with reasonable arguments as to why you should think this, do this, say that, keep company with certain people. He even Christianizes the reasons. I've heard this many, many times down the years. But how can such and such hear the gospel? They don't know any other Christians except me. Well, it sounds like a great, compassionate, loving reason to keep them in your life. But if a friendship and a relationship is leading you away from Jesus, Jesus is perfectly capable of raising up someone else to talk to your friend. I've seen it happen. It's not all down to you. If it's damaging you, You've got to do something about it. And it also tests that person because when you're out the picture, will they still be interested in Jesus? Maybe, maybe not. But just don't fall for it. Speaking of the devil disguising himself and sounding reasonable through false teachers, 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen, For Satan himself masquerades, disguises himself as an angel of light. He can Christianize, he's good at Christian arguments that aren't Christian. He's far more successful when he's subtle than when he's on full attack. Because when he's on full attack, you see his teeth, you know he's a lion and you get rid of him. Now here's one more positive in our psalm. How to stay happy in Jesus? By delighting in what God says, God's word. Verse 2, but his delight, so he's not doing that, there's a big but now, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. You know, whatever you think on, I think we've established, affects our desires. A person starts thinking how the world thinks, starts desiring that, they're not desiring Jesus, and off they go. How do you prevent that? There's a preventative here, as well as a, war there's a warning, as well as a process to help some who have perhaps found themselves in that situation. But how do you prevent that? How do you keep happy in Jesus and keep the desires for Jesus? Because there's a battle for your mind out there, and there's a battle for who you love out there. Well, instead of listening to the world, listen to the word. Instead of adopting what others think, Adopt what God thinks. How do you delight in the word? By digging deep into it. Because when you start doing that, you find that you never get to the bottom of it. There is one layer after another layer of truth and revelation. There is more about Jesus to be plumbed in the depths of scripture. The living word walks around the pages of the written word by the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah! And pathways... <laughs> What's that got to do with it? <laughs> Pathways is one of those things, and there are many simple tools to get to the heart of what God's really saying in his word, not what you think he's saying. I'm guilty. We're all guilty. And uh, we do a little group at the moment, Jim, me, and some of it, Malcolm. Uh, it's in the daytime, and we are buzzing every time as things start coming out in a fresh way or a new way, and it's so simple. And I've been in ministry, I've been a Christian for... 38 years, I've been in ministry for 25. Every Wednesday I see something different. That proves it. You dig in, you get the diamonds. Otherwise you're just on the surface all the time, getting the gravel. You can't delight in the word 
unless you're regularly digging into it and meditating on it, as our text says. Instead of spending time thinking what the world says, spend time thinking on what God says. How, how do you do that? Chew it over. Carry it around with you in your mind. I mean, we've all got to go to work. Of course, we don't think about it all the time, but in the time where you can think, carry it around in your mind. It's easy to rush reading the Bible, isn't it? But hurry is the enemy of the Bible reader. Just take maybe one thing that spoke... You don't have to read reams and reams and chunks and chunks of Scripture. I mean, I've done that, and that's good, but sometimes just a few verses. But just take one thing that spoke to you or resonated with you and think on it all day and all night. Pull it apart. Think of all the ramifications of it. Help it to lead to Jesus until it becomes a part of you. Because God says, I desire truth in the inner part. What the world thinks shapes you, and you become like the world. Same with what God thinks. He starts to shape you and influence you. He is the best and the most reliable influencer. He should be one of those YouTube influencers that has eternal uh, subscribers. And you see, if you delight in God's word and you meditate on it, you become more like Jesus and less like those who don't know Jesus. So dig deep into the word and start to think, as one theologian said, think God's thoughts after him. Isn't that great? Think God's thoughts after him. Imagine going around thinking God's thoughts. That's what you can do. Imagine allowing God's thoughts to dominate instead of all the other stuff we're bombarded with. That brings happiness, that brings content, that brings a love for Jesus that you don't get anywhere else. Because what happens? Delight in Jesus through his word. Use the scripture to get to Jesus. You become content and happy and satisfied in him. What happens? Just as one who adopts the world thoughts desires what the world desires, you begin to desire what Christ desires. Your heart begins to step, um, beat in sync with his. What happens next? Instead of becoming like those who live their lives without Christ and become immune to sin and turn on those who follow Christ, you start becoming like Christ and start shining for him. And then what happens? Others see it, they're attracted, and then they come to the Lord as well. Jesus says, likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. If we delight in Jesus and his word, delight becomes detectable. You can see it. You can see the evidence of it. Verse 3. He is like a tree planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Why? Because that tree is feeding on the life-giving water. Why? Because you're feeding on the life-giving water of the word. It takes a while to get the fruit. But daily drawing upon the streams of water, it will show its fruit in season at the proper time. And the tree stays evergreen. Its leaves don't wither. Even in the, in the frost comes and the storms come and the snow comes and the heat comes. It remains healthy because it's in the right place, drawing nourishment from the right source. That's what this is what about. Does that describe you, that tree planted by streams of living water bearing fruit in season, not withering, spiritually I mean. We all wither outwardly. Is that you day in, day out, day out drawing upon the life-giving source of the word? It's hard. It's really hard sometimes. But it is so worth it. I mean, let's face it. If we were to calculate all the hours, not talking about work, but all the hours that we spend Choosing things that are nothing to do with Christ and not very helpful over the time we could have spent discovering Christ through worship songs, through prayer, through scripture reading, through meeting up with each other in the week, encouraging, you name it, anything. But at first, when you begin to do this, it seems really hard. It doesn't seem to be making much 
difference. And let's face it, sometimes when we read our Bibles, it can be stale as, it can be almost boring, and nothing ever really connects. But it all goes deep down. From infancy, when you weren't interested, and when you, even when you rebelled, suddenly when the spirit's at work in your adulthood, it all comes out. So it didn't go, it didn't wash over you, it's retained in your spiritual hard disk here. And it's a very large hard disk. And um, if you keep seeking the Lord, and if you keep feeding on him, and encountering him by his spirit through his word, you do begin to change. You desire him more, you delight in him more, you love to follow him, you get to know him, you walk with him, and there is nothing like it. There really isn't. It's, better, it's out of this world because it is out of this world. And maybe you don't notice it, and that could be all sorts of reasons, because you're always down on yourself, and you always have a terrible view of yourself. But others notice it. And friends, if you notice this fruit in somebody else and uh, they're of that disposition where they can't see it because they're so down on themselves, tell them, encourage them. I see it. It's, I, had a, I had a cousin who, she died sadly, um, but I had a, I had a cousin uh, and she was absolutely stunning and she thought she was thoroughly unattractive. And I said, here's the evidence. There are boys like bees around the honey pot at every sort of church and every sort of Christian conference and, and you think you're not attractive. Don't be ridiculous. But sometimes people are so down on themselves they just can't see it. But others can see it. So it's up to us, friends, who don't necessarily think like that to go and encourage those that do and say, yes, there is fruit. We can see it. It's clear you're shining. Take encouragement. And you see, when you dig in deep and you delight in God's word, you, you look back over a while and you see what God's been doing in you and you realise that you're not actually the one you used to be. And it's great. And you don't think like you used to think. And it's great. And you don't desire what you used to desire. And you're able to live in ways that before you were thought impossible and you could only dream of. And now you're living it. Why? Because of the power of the Spirit through the Word to get to Jesus. God says this, Isaiah 55, 10. As the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater, so is my word that comes out of my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. And then it says this, here's the benefit. You will go out in joy and be led forth in peace. The mountains and hills will burst into song before you. The hills are alive with the sound of music. Is what he's almost saying. That except the hills, yeah, they come alive and they sing. Maybe Julie Andrews got it from this verse. And it says, and all the trees of the field will clap their hands. And I know it's uh, metaphorical or whatever, but, you know, it's almost that vision where there goes a child of God. Come on, says creation. Come on, he's delighting in God's word. And God's doing exactly what he said he'd do. And he's responding to the word. Uh, Fair play. Hallelujah. The trees are doing that. Keep delving into Jesus. Keep joining with others who are on the same journey. And Bible says you will change, you will change from glory into glory until you get to glory. And then delighting God's word brings prosperity. Verse 3, whatever he does prospers. Now the Old Testament promised material blessings often for faithfulness. Not really so much in the New Testament regardless of what people say. God promises that he will provide our needs, not necessarily our wants and not necessarily physical riches. Sometimes he blesses us with physical riches, but sometimes he doesn't. But the New Testament talks instead about the unsearchable riches of Christ, Ephesians 3.8. And let me tell you, that's much better. Spiritual blessings that keep on coming as you seek Christ. They never run dry as we keep digging for them. We keep searching for them. The spiritual riches of Christ. If you want to be rich, get into those riches. Those are the ones that last beyond the grave. 
Material riches are only promised in the new earth, where we have a room in a mansion. It could be figurative, who knows, but it's going to be a proper earth, tangible earth, where nobody wants for anything. Delight in God's word brings prosperity, but we may observe that some without Christ, who are living without Christ now, and even reject Christ, are prosperous now, some. And the psalmist in Psalm 32, this did his heading. So that's Psalm 73. This did his heading. And in verse 2 he says, But as for me, my feet had almost slipped. I nearly lost my foothold, for I envied the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. You see, and then he goes on to say, They didn't appear, the ones I was looking at, they didn't seem to appear to struggle with anything. They were healthy. They didn't really get sick. They didn't seem to have much worries about anything. And they lived brilliantly without God. So they said, who needs God? I don't. I'll live my life the way I want. And so then he asked himself, what have I got since I followed Jesus? What's in it for me? Well, there's the lie, my friends. Because those who reject Jesus may gorge on the juicy bait at the moment, but they forget the hook underneath. If we delight in God's word, we bear fruit, and we also get God's eternal perspective. Verse 3, those who follow Jesus are like a tree planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. And then Psalm 73, 16, this man who was almost about to give up because he saw the blessings of those who rejected Christ and he himself was suffering. And then he says, 73, 16, when I tried to understand all this, it was oppressive to me till I entered the sanctuary of God. Then I understood the final destiny of the wicked. Christian, your best days are eternally ahead of you. Verse 6, for the Lord watches over the way of the righteous. Your leaf does not wither. Everything you think and say and do for Jesus down here is storing up eternal treasure and limitless reward starting now and finishing up then and isn't it amazing on that day that God who has enabled us given us desires in our hearts melted our hard hearts drawn us to himself he's kind of done all the work and then he by his spirit enables us to live for Jesus praises us for living for Jesus that's incredible. Rewards us for living for Jesus when we could only do it through his cross and through his power. What kind of God is that? Double great. Generous. Rewarding those who don't, will, don't deserve anything. Unconditional love. Well, there are rewards, so they have a condition, but nevertheless. And let me say this, if you're trusting Jesus here this morning with your life, when you finally get to see him, things get better and better and better. And down here, your relationship with him, everything else is, goes to whatever you want to call it, pot. But your relationship with him gets better and better and stronger and stronger and the kingdom that is unshakable and the king that will always remain is the one who's going to be around forever. <coughs> but let me finish with this. The best days for those who reject Jesus down here are temporary. Verse 4. Not so the wicked. They are like chaff that the wind blows away. They're here one minute, they're gone the next. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous, those made right by God. But the way of the wicked will perish. If you choose life and to live life without Christ here, he'll grant your wish to live without him at the judgment at the end of all things. 
The difference is, though you may choose to live your life without Christ down here, he still sustains you down here. He still gives you blessings, which he gives to everyone down here. He gives you your next breath. He could decide to end it right now, but he doesn't. He gives you food. He gives you clothing. He gives you other things, lots of good, good things. You're dependent on him, even if you think you're not. That's the irony of it. But there is a day coming when time disappears and is no more. And God says, you didn't want to live with me on earth. And you still don't now. Which comes back to sinners won't stand in the assembly of those who know Christ. Because they didn't want to now. And they won't want to then. Everybody wants the benefits of heaven. Not many want the king of heaven. But those on that day in the new earth will be those who want to be there because they've loved Jesus, because they've lived for Jesus, and they still love Jesus, and they still want to live for Jesus. And the best thing on earth ever is for them to live forever with Jesus, and that's the point of heaven, because there'd be no heaven without Jesus. And here's the sad, sad news. The difference between living without God now and living with him, without, without him then is that hell is a place where God's blessings are absent, but his justice is present. People say God is a place where God isn't. That's not what the Bible says. Jesus is present over hell for justice. I'll read the passage for you in a minute. But the door of salvation is shut. The devil isn't tormenting people in hell. He's going to be tormented. Jesus is present there simply for justice. Revelation 14.10, speaking of those who reject Jesus, follow the mark of the beast. They too will drink of the wine of God's fury, which has been poured full strength in the cup of his wrath. He will be tormented with burning sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and of the Lamb. That is so grim, that is horrific, that is horrible, but Jesus will be there. There's no place where Jesus isn't. The sixth, the way of the wicked will perish. So let me say this as we close. Jesus is here right now by his spirit. If you could see him, his arms are still wide open with the nail-pierced hands and the nail-pierced feet and the spear mark in his side, doing that for you as a sinner, an unforgiven sinner. And he's offering you right now. And he's offering you today to come to him. And those nail-pierced hands and feet are crying out. I did this for you. Come to me. Come to me now. The way is now open for you to get into relationship with Jesus. And you know what? Don't try and improve yourself before you come. All you need to do is just give me your sin. Give me all your filth. Give me all your guilt. Give me all your shame. And I will take away the power of that and the penalty of that. And I will wipe away all your past, all the skeletons in the closet, things that only God knows that you've never told anybody else. Gone. Don't exist anymore. If you come to me, I'll cleanse you clean. I'll wipe it out. I'll forgive you. And I'll give you a new heart with new desires and a new life and a new start. If you would just come and follow me, that's what he says each and every day to everyone who isn't his. Today is the day of salvation. Tomorrow never comes. It never comes. Here's your moment. Here's your opportunity. How long do you know? You don't know what's going to happen after this. Wouldn't it be amazing if all of us that ever entered the doors of Hope Church and all the people we're in contact with will join us when we're looking to God's right hand as the stars begin to fall? What an incredible thing that would be if every single person turns to Jesus. That's his will. His will is to save. He doesn't want anyone to perish, but all to come to Jesus Christ in repentance and faith. Could you be one of them this morning? I pray that you will be. Back to Christian. Maybe at the beginning of this process, 
maybe you're being influenced too much by people around you and by the world and you're curious and you're getting pulled back in you can cut it dead now you can stop now you can you've come the same way again through the nail pierced hand and you can call out to him and he will have mercy and he will reinstate you and he will turn you around and you will find your joy in him again if that's you come to Jesus again this morning and you who are pretty consistent and pretty faithful and do the sorts of things that behind the scenes that nobody really knows about you don't want your recognition for it because you're doing it for the Lord and the Lord only there's a big reward coming for you but it's still through the nail pierced hands we always come through the nail pierced hands and he is proud of you just keep on doing what you're doing keep going one foot in front of the other there will be people in this church um, when we come to that day and you might be surprised because they're quiet or they're timid you might be surprised that they are talking of rewards at the front of the queue and you're further at the back I'm at the front I fully expect to be at I'm at the front here I mean I fully expect to be near the back on that day because I know that there are people here who are building up treasures in heaven that I couldn't only dream of. So, be encouraged, be warned, and get back with Jesus. Let's come to prayer. Father, first of all, forgive us our many sins, even today. Forgive us when we get enticed by the world, we're bombarded with so much stuff and sometimes we neglect your word and it's your word that counterbalances that. Truth is the antidote to all the lies that swarm around our heads. So Lord, help us to be more regular in your word, to take that time to dig deep, to know where those diamonds are, because they are there and there are many. And Lord, help us to become miners that we can drill down deep. For those who've just come to Christ, there are many things on the surface and just below the surface. Enjoy those, rejoice in those, it's all new. But for those of us further on, we still need to dig. Lord, we pray that you would help us, give us the discipline to do that, give us the desire to do that, and help us to bear fruit in season, and help us to keep our eyes on Jesus and patiently wait, actively wait, by the way we live for him and love for him for that day when he appears. It won't be long, no doubt. And then... One minute he'll be here and all of this will be gone and it won't matter anymore. But it matters now. It really matters now. Help us to build for eternity. Help us to trust in you, Jesus, and you alone for the power, the desire, the life, the forgiveness of sins. In Jesus' name, amen.